So how's it going, everybody? This is Ron Sparkman, and I am the Chief Curiosity Correspondent for the Space Foundation Discovery Center. And today we have a really a perfect guest for Hubble's birthday and all the launches going on and everything that's coming up in the very near future. We have Mary Liz Bender, a part of the Cosmic Perspective team, and we're going to talk to her about all kinds of amazing things. Uh, so Mary Liz, first, welcome on the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's awesome to be here. And uh, so it was actually supposed to be both you and Ryan, but Ryan can't be here today for a very cool reason. So if you want to share that, like what he's up to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I was hoping that I could somehow join him, but uh, it's very complex. So we chase rockets, as you know, and he is out there doing just that right now. So we had a SpaceX rocket launch on Wednesday just a couple of days ago. And now what happens in Cape Canaveral on Florida's magical space coast is that SpaceX recovers all of their fairings and their rockets. And so the rocket booster is currently waiting its way on a giant drone ship. Of course, I still love you. And it is waiting its way towards the port of Canaveral along with the fairing boats. And so Ryan is out there trying to, you know, grab some film, set up, be ready by the time that they come into the port. So he's set up his cameras and, um, yeah, trying to capture that beautiful display. So we never know when this stuff is going to happen. And to be completely honest, oftentimes it's wrong. Like we get there, we're five minutes late somehow, or we're there for five hours waiting. Uh, so it's a very intense thing, but um, it's it's super exciting. So I'm kind of jealous, but. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> I, I am too. Uh, it's definitely one of my favorite places, uh, you know, on the planet is to, to be there, especially when something big's going on. Uh, the energy that's there at the Space Coast is unlike any other during launch time. So I, yeah. I, I definitely envy you for that one. So um, we're, we're going to dive yeah. into all that in just a little bit, what you all do in the incredibly cool life that you lead. Uh, but first, let's talk about, you know, what was the inspiration for you for space and science? How did you fall in love with this? And, uh, you know, where did that all start? Well, this is a this is going to be a very long answer for you. Uh, but <laughs> the case is that I actually grew up in a rural area of Missouri, and I went to a school that actually didn't teach science. I never had a science class, and so I didn't discover my love of science until I was in my I think mid twenties. Um, and the way that I did that was by watching Cosmos. Um, but I always loved the stars and I was really, really lucky that since I grew up in that rural area, um, my farm had a beautiful view of the Milky Way. So every night I would just, as a child, lay down and stare at the Milky Way. And if you haven't had a chance uh, to see that with your own eyes, it is absolutely life changing. So I feel really lucky that I always had that connection to the sky. And then, you know, as I got older, and discovered astronomy and cosmology, I just dove headfirst in, super in love. Um, so basically I watched Cosmos and I just kept thinking to myself, what can I do? Like, I'm not a scientist. I never had a science education. I, I honestly don't know where to apply my skills to get involved in this. Um, so it was about that time that I discovered my local astronomical society, which is uh, probably something that exists near anybody that's watching this. Um, but this was in Kentucky. So the Louisville Astronomical Society was like my saving grace. They changed everything for me. They had these public star parties and, you know, I, I would come and I would, I, I'll never forget the first time I went, they treated me like, royalty. They treat everybody that comes in their doors like royalty. And they let you, you know, tour their scopes and tour the night sky. And that's where I got my first glimpse of Saturn's rings and Jupiter's moons. And that is another one of those transformative experiences that um, really shaped my path. So I fell in love with astronomy um, I got my first telescope. They helped me through that process, helped me learn how to use it. And um, I became I, a member of the board of the Astronomical Society. And through that, I actually got to meet a lot of amazing people. It really opened the door um, 
I met astronauts through them. I met uh, NASA engineers through them who also became my mentors later in life. So um, it, it was, you know, I think volunteering for them was probably the single most important thing that I could have done that shifted me to the space industry. Prior to that, I was a, a programmer and, um, you know, I, I loved coding, but I got really tired of just crunching away on lines of code for 18 hours a day. And I really loved the human interaction that I got with astronomy. And then of course, the perspective that you get when you look through these time machines and you see ancient light. Uh, it To me, it was like, it was this amazing tool for taking my silly provincial tiny problems and making them smaller and smaller. And, uh, you know, just thinking about the magic of existence that we unlikely creatures came to actually be aware of ourselves and, and have the ability to then look out into the stars. I, I just desperately wanted to take this transformative thought process and gift it to the rest of the world because it's what really got me out of some pretty dark times, to be honest. Um, and at the same time, I'd always been a musician and I was a touring musician at the time of my uh, awakening to this. And so while I was on tour, I found that it was very, very powerful to be on a stage. It was very powerful to have a platform when people are coming to you desperate for an experience. And I, I, I just, while I was going through that process, realizing how magical it is to create an experience for people that are hungry for one, and then this beautiful perspective that really helped shape my life um, and bring me to such a great place, I just wanted to marry the two together. And so the idea for Cosmic Perspective was born before I even knew what it was going to be called or that I was gonna find this amazing partner to form it with. Um, Brian isn't here, but I should well, probably explain a little. How he explain. That's perfect, that is, that is the segue into the next question. So you started a journey at the same time he did and then the two of you end up meeting up with this kind of same, I'll let you tell it, please share with us. Uh, so Ryan Chalinski, for, for people that don't know the other half of the leadership team, I know there's some other folks too, and you're more than welcome to talk about them as well. Um, and kind of tell us a little bit about how that kind of happened and how you ended up finding each other on this journey. It was magical. I mean, it's it was truly magical. I am so in love with this guy. So Ryan Chalinski um, came into my life in the most curious fashion. I. I had just decided that I was not going to um, continue living my life the way that I had. I, I had been living in Louisville, Kentucky. I had been a touring musician. And it came to a point where um, we had just gotten off of a big tour and you know we were writing new records, but just kind of realizing we didn't want to be on the road consistently, constantly, which we had been for about four and a half years. And so, I realized that I had been kind of velocitized, like I, um, I I didn't feel right being inside four walls without wheels. <laughs> and so I decided this is my time to embark on this journey that's so important to me. So this is an important moment, this is an important fact to remember. It was a moment where I realized I needed to chase this mission. So I sold my home, I sold everything I owned and I hit the road. I was inspired by the NASA Astrovan, which Ron, you may have seen before. It's on display at Kennedy Space Center. Oh um, yes, I have. <laughs> That's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> well, until that, you guys did. <laughs> well, it's pretty cool. That beautiful Airstream silver bullet, and that's that's the version that I'm referring to, that um, delivered so many of our astronauts to the launch pads. So it's just this beautiful motorhome with a NASA logo on it. I was so inspired by that when I saw it at Kennedy Space Center, but I immediately went home and sketched it up and I had made my own version. So I was going to roam the cosmos. That was the name of my little initiative. <laughs> and, and I was just gonna take space on tour. That was pretty much the extent of my idea. I was gonna do you know, presentations, uh, sidewalk astronomy. And so 
I hit the road. Um, I did not get a beautiful silver bullet Airstream because they cost about $45,000 and that's not including the observatory I wanted to install. So I ended up just getting a, a cheap pull behind trailer and I took off with my band van that I had purchased and, <laughs> and I hit the road and came directly down to Florida because you know, if you're going to start taking space on tour, you're going to have to start at the Space Coast. It only makes sense if you're in the United States that you would start in Florida um, at Cape Canaveral, which I call the portal to the universe. Um, but I came here and um, I, I'd been camping here for a little bit and realized, oh, gosh, it's going to be hard to leave immediately. I'm, I might have to stick around because there are all these amazing rocket launches happening. And I'll never forget um, my first rocket launch I saw was the Falcon Heavy, the first Falcon Heavy. I was standing shoulder to shoulder between Bill Nye and Buzz Aldrin, two of my heroes. Um, I had gotten a remote job with the Planetary Society at the time. And I just immediately, I was like, oh, oh, like, oh, by the way, this image right here, that's the launch that I'm referring to, but this is not an image I took. This is an image Ryan took. So we'll get to that. Um, anyway. I love the split too. Like I love the way that <laughs> looks. That's a really cool look. I was noticing that earlier. And what's kind of cool is for some reason, the video is being a little weird. So it's kind of like going in and out on it. So it looks like it's moving. It almost looks like your, a like your AR stuff, which is kind of you cool. You know what? <laughs> Thank you for saying that. I actually had the green screen option on. It's it's off now. <laughs> oh, that's, that's what I was. I was like, I wonder what it's doing with that, but it's a cool effect. <laughs> cool. Yeah, this actually everything's augmented reality enabled that we make now. So um, we can talk about that later. But meanwhile, um, I, I knew that I wanted to take space on tour, and the original idea was that I would take astronomy on tour. But then I saw my first rocket launch. And I fell madly in love. It was another one of those transformative experiences. It's like, you know, you always get, you have these moments in your life, I do, where you pause and you have this major epiphany. It's like the overview effect where you're suddenly like, oh my gosh, I have a new sense of scale of time or space or, you know, my life and the magic of existence. And seeing a rocket launch is like getting a new sense of scale for the human race and what we're capable of. And you don't feel like you're not a part of it. You very much feel like, oh my gosh, I, part of the human race, am sending this crazy thing to space. What else can we do? So anyway, another transformative moment occurred. And instead of leaving right away, I decided to stick around and catch the next set of launches. Um, the next one was Tess. Tess was such an awesome launch to watch. And then there was Yuri's night. That was April 12th, a couple of years ago. Yuri's night at Kennedy Space Center. I went there. I had been introduced to some, some new friends, some space reporters, Robin Seemingle, uh, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. And so I met these guys. I didn't know that Ryan was there. I hadn't met Ryan yet, but Ryan was there and he had this image on display at his booth. And sometimes I like to think back to how did I miss him? Where was he when I was just right there in the corner? Um, but it was just a couple days later that our friend Robin invited us to this, this meetup at Preacher Bar, which is like a, you know, a staple here in Cocoa Beach where everybody meets after a launch. And I was, ex <laughs> good food. You know what? It's, it's not often that a pub has good food, yeah. but they actually have great food. And I have celiac disease, so I'm really particular about, you know, eating out and they have gluten-free pizza. They have gorgeous, gigantic salads. Yeah, I love it. So um, we uh, we were there. It was my first time there. And I'm sitting around a table with all these space friends, the new space family, all the rocket crew, as they're often referred to. And I was talking to a couple friends. And they were asking me, who are you? What are you about? What are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm roaming the cosmos and this is my plan. And, and I start to explain, you know, I sold my home. I sold everything I owned. I took off and I got into a camper and I'm taking space on tour. And <laughs> one person said, wow, that is so unique. That is so interesting. I've never heard of anyone doing anything like that. And I was like, 
no, no one's doing anything like it. I've been doing a lot of market research. I, I know for sure. And I just had this certainty. And it was about that moment when from the other side of this human, Ryan's head comes out and he says, oh, hi, yeah, um, what you're doing is extremely unique and it's so exciting. I too live in a camper. <laughs> it's, awesome. it's called, get this, it's called Voyager 3, the dark sky research vehicle. That's so awesome. And I'm looking at him and I'm just like, my mouth gaping open, I'm probably making this kind of face. Like, what, who is this guy? Where did he come from? What's going on? Um, and he continues to explain that he he embarked on this journey, uh, you know, maybe a, even a year prior to me. And he'd sold his home. He'd sold everything that he owned. He left his corporate IT cushy life, just like I did. And he embarked on this journey, um, originally wanting to teach people the way that he always had, um, how to take astrophotography, like dark sky photography, time-lapse photography was um, his niche and he even wrote a book about it. And um, here I am freaking out, like who is this guy? <laughs> and anyway, it was honestly, it was love at first sight. I um, definitely ran away from him for the first couple of months. I was terrified of him because I had decided now I'm gonna be single forever and this is, you know, I'm, I'm never falling in love, you know? but I immediately fell madly in love with him. And about the same time that I'd met him, he purchased the domain cosmicperspective.com. And it was, it was that perspective that he wanted to gift to people through his art. He is an amazing, as you know, Ron, an amazing cinematographer, obviously incredible photographer. And he too had that same moment where, um, actually his story is really, really cool he went to a NASA social for CRS-5. So quite a few years ago, got in on a NASA, NASA social program, so cool. You apply as non-media, just a human that wants to go experience a launch and um, NASA just expects you to share it with your social media following. And so you apply, there's a process and then you get hopefully admitted and then you get access just like the media to the launch pad, you get to take tours, you get to meet, um, you know, owners, CEOs of space companies. It's a magical experience. So he, he got his first taste at CRS-5. He placed his first remote camera and immediately fell in love. And, um, I, you know, since he's not here, I just have to brag on him a little bit because I, I can now. <laughs> um, He's a he's a DIY engineering guy and he loves to make robots for his cameras. So he's always pushing the edge. Every launch, he puts out like five to six cameras sometimes. And you know, he'll always want to do something that he hasn't done before. Right now, he's been experimenting with a rocket tracker robot. So he'll set the camera at the launch pad. And you know, we we have to leave the launch pad. We set the camera. Yeah days or hours before the launch and you then be, you can't be any closer than what like two and a half three miles or something like that from it somewhere around there yeah two and a half i think is the closest we've ever been anyway um but so so everything has to work autonomously it has to be pre-programmed and then you gotta rely on a crazy battery system to make sure you can run these big giant uh cameras but this thing um basically it's a an autonomous tracker that lifts the camera so that it follows the rocket as it lifts up into the sky and it, it works so it's so beautiful um so he does that he's done things where he's made a uh, mechanical finger like literally it's a mechanical finger that pushes his slow-mo camera buttons because they don't have a way to be triggered the way other cameras do <laughs> So um, he does a lot of really exciting things like that. He'll set out a little old school Polaroid, you know, camera and a little mechanical finger will shoot uh, a beautiful Polaroid out. And then it's so exciting because, you know, you get to go to the press briefings. You get to talk to the people that make the missions happen. You get to interview the astronauts. You get to talk to NASA's administrator, Jim Bridenstine. Um, and then, you know, you set out the cameras and then you come back to the press site 
And from the press site or the causeway, depending on the launch pad, you get to watch the launch from two and a half to three miles away. And that's really close. And it's important to be as close as you can because that's when you feel it and that's it's it, just that, that feeling. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's I that mean is we it. talked about it a little bit earlier. It's like it that's another one of those life changing experiences. And it's really it's shocking how much of the story that you've shared so far is very similar. Like I was a DJ. I knew um, I didn't know that I had really any interest in space. Then I watched Cosmos, and then I fell in love with it and said, "I have to do this forever." I came really close. Like uh, my uh, my roommate and I were talking about it for a long time. I wanted to get a tiny home and attach it to my hybrid, and then drive across the country and like go to all the different space and science museums. I've been to like seventy some so far, and I thought it'd be cool to do it. Just mine would be a little more in, but I love the sidewalk astronomy thing. But that rocket launch, that the first real one that I got to go to last year, it was nighttime, um, and it just so happened to be that. So it was the one where um, Israel was sending the moon, uh, their moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my friend from Israel was there. My friend that uh, I was in a con with the student astronaut contest that um, Emily Calandrelli does on her TV show. He was there, and he is from Israeli descent. And then, like one of the people that uh, Sarah, that Sarah Silva, that does photography for like my group. So it's like all of us together, and it just all came together like right at once. Um, and Matt, uh, Matt Haskell was there. He actually showed us the place where we were like going to watch it. So it was all these things that kind of converged together after going to uh, Zarellas, right? And it's just an amazing experience. That was a sixteen-hour turnaround. I'm talking about flying into town all of that and then leaving and it was worth every single moment of it. And that's what you all get to live all the time. That's all like time. what that is. And the, I, most people don't really know what it's like to be a rocket chaser. So what, like what's a day in the life for you? Like of getting up and staying up. Sometimes you have to stay up real late. Sometimes you have to get up real early and I'll walk us through a little bit of like that, that 24 hours of hurry up and wait. <laughs> it's absolutely insane. You know what it's like. Um, so, as a touring musician, it's kind of a similar thing. It is, I mean, you're on a crazy tight schedule. Um, people expect a lot of out, out of you, you know. Um, people think that that kind of lifestyle and maybe even this kind of lifestyle is glamorous. It is not glamorous. <laughs> it is the least glamorous lifestyle in the universe, especially being on tour. Um, but it it's kind of like that, but, you know, as a musician, you get that payoff every single night where you're on stage, you know, if it's a good show. <laughs> if it's not a good show, it, it doesn't turn out as great. But um, but you get that exhilarating, adrenaline-filled, you know, beautiful experience every night. And this has the same thing, but it's just like all day long, there's just something really exciting happening. So uh, a day in the life. I'll take Wednesday as an example because every launch is extremely different. Um, but Wednesday was actually, uh, obviously because of the times that we're living in right now, it was really, really different. But um, normally what would happen is you would go maybe the day before a launch and you would you know, get your press credentials you'd go to Kennedy Space Center, uh, you'd go to the press site, and maybe you'll go to some press briefings, meet up with your rocket buddies, get on the bus, you know, a uh, dog comes around and, and sniffs all the bags, and then you, you take off on the bus, get to the launch pad, set out your cameras, and then you've got to prepare them for like eight to 16 hours in advance, typically, and you go home, and then, you know, you get up, maybe it's really late at night, maybe it's really early in the morning. We never know when these launches are gonna happen. And so often it's dark outside um, or, you know, dawn. And and then you, you go out to set up for the actual rocket launch moment. And, and then you, you know, sometimes you get to collect your cameras right afterwards. And sometimes you have to wait many hours or even a day. So um, there's all sorts of adrenaline and anticipation that goes along with it. But Wednesday was very different because um, there, there aren't a lot of personnel to support media right now, and we have to be extremely cautious. So we have to wear you know, full protective gear, gloves, masks. We can't be within 15 feet of any person. Um, I'm really, really grateful that they're still accommodating for this. 
Um, it's that thing that really gives me a lot of hope, you know, and excitement in these times. But um, it's a little upsetting that you can't like be with your friends, like the Rocket Crew. I can't hug my Rocket Crew right now. I know we're all feeling this in our own ways. Um, but anyway, so Wednesday was a crazy full day. I woke up at 5 a.m. This is this is typical. Woke up at 5 a.m., rushed to get all of the cameras into the truck. Um, and, you know, Ryan stayed up all night the night before preparing his cameras. It is such a long process to make sure everything is properly programmed, that it's all on the right tripod, that, you know, everything's been accounted for. So it's a pretty stressful, but exciting, exhilarating morning. So 5 a.m., he's like rechecking all the settings, like, oh, did I get everything while I was up in the middle of the night, <laughs> half asleep, half awake? All right, I think we got everything. Do we have the hammer? Do we have the stakes? Do we have, you know, the protective bags? Because, you know, uh, Florida weather is crazy, winds, rains, heat, sun. And so we have to protect the cameras and all the batteries to make sure that we don't lose um, power to overheating and all that. So we're, we're rechecking the stocks. We're getting it all into the truck. We get in that truck. It's the same camper, by the way. It's Voyager 3. Get in the truck, you know, get some coffee, and we take off uh, to Kennedy Space Center. We get to the press site. We collect our credentials. And then we immediately go to uh, the press site, um, the area where we, we set up for a convoy line. So this is really different. Usually we'd get on a media bus, but right now, the one of the cool things that we're getting to experience is that we actually get to drive our vehicles directly to the launch pad. <laughs> so this is a very, very unique experience. That sounds new. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have, I've some, I have some cool pictures of Voyager 3 sitting at the launch pad. And it's been to pad 40, SpaceX pad 40. It's been to um, SpaceX launch pad 39A. Uh, so that's one I was going to ask about. It's like, has it been to the legendary one? <laughs> Let's talk about it because that's actually where I'm taking you right now. On Wednesday, uh, you know, while many times the Falcon 9 will launch from pad 40, on Wednesday it launched from 39A. 39A is the pad that lifted our Apollo astronauts to the moon. So SpaceX has, you know, kind of redesigned it and reconfigured it for the Falcon Heavy, for the Falcon 9. And now what's, I just got chills. Now what's so exciting is that there's a crew access arm. I know. Uh, and it's pretty too. Like it's, it's weird beautiful. to say, oh, hey, you know what? That's, that's a, that's a machine arm. That's going to allow people to walk across and get it. But just, it's a, it's really is gorgeous. Like they did a great job with it. If nothing else, SpaceX can design some stuff. <laughs> oh, they can. If nothing else, they can definitely design. They can engineer some stuff. They can design some stuff. It's it's really beautiful, and um, and I'll, I'll I'll get back to the crew access arm in a minute. But it's just so cool to see that you you know Bob and Doug, um, Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley are the NASA commercial crew astronauts. They're gonna they're going to walk across that crew access arm on May twenty seventh, hopefully, to take off. For the first time, that will be the first time that humans launch from Florida, from anywhere that isn't Kazakhstan, right? Yep. Um, since 2011, since the end of the shuttle era. So this is a really, really exciting time. And to be at that pad and to consider all the history and to consider the future and to be there in the present is something else. And on, on top of all of that, Wednesday was Earth Day. And it's a special day to me. I mean, every day is Earth Day, right? But yeah. to to have a moment of pause to really think about it and to think about the beginning of that movement while I was there at that pad, I, I was actually, this is also part of the typical schedule of a crazy rocket chaser. Um, you get inspired in the moment. And so, and you've always got your computer with you. So I had this computer on my lap in the truck and um, it was a strange situation where because we couldn't be anywhere near anybody else while we were setting up cameras. Um, they would let out 10 people at a time and we had to sprawl out on the lawn, which is pretty easy to do. So we had a lot of time in between placing cameras. They'll always give us like, you know, a few locations where we can set up. So we would set up 
get back in the truck. And I was just having this moment on Wednesday where I was feeling so inspired. And I sat there and I wrote this article in between, you know, camera setups, like <sighs> Earth Day was inspired by the perspectives that we got during the Apollo missions. Yep. It Very was. And yeah, 50 years ago. And I mean, this whole week has been mind blowing. So what was it a week ago? It was we're going to launch on May 27th. We're going to launch, you know, American astronauts on American soil with American technology. Then it was International Dark Sky Week started. Then it was the launch. Then it was um, now today is the 30th of, of Hubble. You know, and now you guys are capturing all that stuff coming in. It's been a really busy week for space to have. So if it's, there was going to be any day to inspire you, I think that was going to be it. <laughs> it was a good day. And I just saw someone say that the Atlas and Delta launches allow media sometimes, or they used to allow media to drive their own cars uh, to the pad gates. And I've we've done that. We've done that several times. Uh, ULA is so good to us. We love ULA. Not only are those gorgeous rockets and beautiful launches to witness, but um, they are so loving to, to the media, especially like when you're really excited and passionate about what's going on. Mm -hmm. So we've had some really cool opportunities to, to even go on our own, Ryan and I, and drive all the way up, all the way up to the Delta IV Heavy. It's on the pad. And we got to place a VR camera. It's a, a 180 stereoscopic. So we're really into pushing the bounds with altered perception photography. And um, and so we were, you know, we got to get really, really close to get that parallax effect. So it's really impactful in the VR experience that we have. So anyway, I, I digress a little bit, but I just wanted to address that um, comment. But to to get back, I mean, they're Colorado based. I mean, ULA is right up the street from us. We're in Colorado. Oh, Springs, that's right. Denver, so yeah, so I know that they invite people out to come and like watch launches. Launches definitely plan on doing some stuff for like for the Discovery Center and Space Foundation, kind of putting out some video and stuff. So my next awesome. thing is to kind of you know, fall in your all's footsteps in a very different way, but also kind of be like, you know, hey guys, I need some help. <laughs> hey, totally, yeah, and and that's the beautiful thing about the Space Family is that it's too small. And we all know it's too small. I mean, why isn't all of this making major headline news? This looks like, by the way, this is super professional. This looks like I'm on CNN right now. We <laughs> should be on CNN right now. Do you understand what's going on? We're leaving the planet for the first time in human history. We're working on through the Artemis program, through you know what SpaceX is doing. Uh, gosh, new Glenn launch pad. Yep. Like I have a view of it every single morning to see its progress. I'm like, how is this not making global news right now? It's insane. So we, anyway, we consider talking about doing like almost like a space TV type thing with like some of the team members in between education, because it's an organization, an organization full of people that sit around and we talk about space all day. You know, that's our job. You know, we have the space report, you know, that team's incredible putting all those things on paper. Um, you know, all these big things that are coming out space symposiums, you know, that's where a lot of those big news stories come out every year. So we've got so much there and we've seriously considered it. And honestly, um, I, just the idea of getting it out there more, there should be, a, there should be a TV channel for it. I think there should be like, I like the science channel and I like some of the other ones, but I mean something that's sort of along the lines, almost of like Viceland, like where you have like a 24 hours and it's different shows from different perspectives. Like the way that you tell it, isn't the way that Kevin DeBruin tells it, isn't the way that Tim Dodd tells it, isn't the way that Robin tells it. Like, I'll, you know, everybody that's there, nobody does it the same. Nobody like your your pictures don't look like like Krauss's doesn't look like Matt's. None of them are the same, but they're all different. And my favorite one of my favorite things might not necessarily be the launch. It's the couple hours after that when everybody's pictures start coming out on all the different platforms on you know, Reddit and Facebook, especially like the SpaceX group. Everybody's yeah. throwing in there, and everybody's like, "That's the winner." And then they, nope, nope, that's the winner. It's just there's really it's a buzz that nobody can wait to see what you all are gonna. Give give us your perspective of this incredible thing that's going on. Well, that's exactly you know the the real theme here in this discussion is perspective, and I think that's the most important thing to think about is that like you know healthy competition is good because it keeps us all on our toes, but uh, the reality is that we need everybody's perspective, so we have to support one another to make sure that we're all at the table, uh, you know, talking to, about this from our own very unique perspectives. So I'm excited for when you come here. You have to let us know. And I think that the TV show is a great idea. 
it should exist on multiple channels. <laughs> I mean, there should be so many space TV shows, but um, but yeah, I would I would love to see that happen. So um, to get back to the day, so it's Wednesday, it's, it's Earth Day, and uh, this is this is just taking you through the life of the the rocket chaser. So we're setting up our cameras at the pad, and you are rushed. It, it is insane, like you know, maybe if we only had one camera, so it's, it's kind of our fault. Like we're trying to set up so much. <laughs> we've only got $120,000 of cameras out here. Like, you know, so oh, no. in 3D no. it's an AR, everybody's just walking around. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I actually, a cool thing is that um, the equipment that, that Ryan uses is actually, you know, it's, it's consumer level. Um, it's not super expensive. He just really pushes it to the max. He'll find ways to kind of upgrade it in his own way. And uh, there's some great new products coming out that have been really making it possible for um, a normal citizen to do slow-mo photography. So that's that's really Ryan's, um, you know, he keeps adding on to his niche. So I guess I don't know what to say about it anymore, but he is one of the only people that does slow-mo rocket launch video. And it is always stunning and keeps pushing the edge with it. But anyway, um, setting these things up is pretty complicated and, you know, crazy autonomous systems and batteries and then uh, programs where, you know, I've got to open up the terminal on my computer to check to make sure that the time is right, but it has to be an hour ahead and it's GMT and you got to do all these weird calculations. And then you got to, you know, record four minutes into the future for high speed. And it's just, it's, it's super complex and you're in the Florida hot sun and you're sweating and you know, we've got masks and gloves on and like, you can't see the screen, there's a glare suddenly. And uh, it reminds me a lot of like playing a music festival and you're on the main stage and you're like, oh my God, I can't see my MIDI controller because the sun's beating down on it. So I don't know what buttons I'm supposed to be pressing. I mean, it's 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 the same feeling. So Great. you're, you're <laughs> high stress, very high stress. And uh, so we only get 15 to 30 minutes, depending. Um, so it's it's quick. You got to be fast. And um, so so we'll set that stuff out. And then finally, we're done with camera placement. We all convoy back to the press site. You know, this is this is usually when you kind of you take a break. And normally, the uh, press site would be available, so you would just go work in the seats where all of the past. NASA chroniclers have ever worked, you know, Walt, Walter Cronkite, you know, may have been in this chair, I don't know. And so, um, of course, that's not the case now with the pandemic, that's all been closed. So, you know, we get an hour for a break. So you got to scarf your food, you got to check your emails, you got to try to get something out on social media, you got to make sure the time's right, because SpaceX just shifted the time, you know, of the launch. And so the whole day, right? Wasn't it supposed to be on, it was supposed to be on Thursday, and they moved it to Wednesday. Like yes. before, like, oh, we're doing it tomorrow. What? Yes. And and then, <laughs> so, yeah, so they shifted it up, up by a day, which is really tricky. Yeah. And then they shifted it up by seven minutes. So the live stream, you know, the launch liftoff wasn't at 3.37. It was at 3.30. Yeah, they shifted it to 3.30. So, you know, you're trying to get all this stuff done. And at the same time, all of us are trying, we're really trying to up our coverage. It's really hard to do when you're only two people there you know mm -hmm. it, it is insane like all these people work so hard i want you guys to know there's nobody's paying them no one's paying john cross to go out there and set up his camera and immediately post his thing like he gets in his car and immediately uploads the first picture that he finds it's um it is a labor of love and it is intense and i love the passion it is so cool to be around these people so um you know this is the time when normally we'd be trying to set up a live stream. And <laughs> Ryan and I have been using, since Tim Dodd um, brought us in to work on a telescopic rocket tracking collaboration, he he from had to OPT, go home. Right? What's that? From OPT, right? That's work. right, from That's OPT great. telescopes. Awesome, yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll briefly explain that because, um, you know, this is the time where we've got one hour to like scarf our food you know, do whatever work we need to do and then get back to Kennedy Space Center to the press site. And, you know, we get maybe 30 minutes to set up for the launch. And that in that 30 minutes, you have to set up your live stream. You have to set up all the cameras that you want to capture the launch with. 
you have to set up your audio, make sure it's all working. And then we have, we've been setting up this giant camera with, or I'm sorry, this giant telescope from OPT telescopes that is, it belongs to Tim Dodd. He's just not here. So we've been using it. Um, and uh, we've got these, um, they're like simulator joystick controls that have throttle and directional control. I've and seen crazy. <laughs> Scott, yeah. So Scott Ferguson, I got to call out Scott Ferguson from Astronomy Live is the one that programmed the system that actually allows those joysticks to track the telescope, to move the telescope around. So, um, so you know, it's a, it's a huge and crazy endeavor to try to do this in 30 minutes. It's nearly impossible. Um, and, you know, there's this particular launch, we actually only used our little manual four inch Explore Scientific Telescope, which was sponsored by the Louisville Astronomical Society in Kentucky, where I got my start. So um, we actually just used that this time. And um, Ryan manually used it to track the rocket. And because it's such a smaller telescope, it's not it's not a zoomed in. Uh, it, we actually, it was able to look pretty smooth because it was all captured in slow-mo 4K. So when it's in slow-mo, it's, it's more forgiving on like your little jerky m movements. Um, so, you know, we set up for that. We didn't live stream this time. It was just, it was too tight, but um, we captured a gorgeous, gorgeous video. And I got to, since I wasn't like involved in a live stream, I actually got to stand back and take it in. And I love when I get to do that again, because it's, it's far more powerful. I, I, I want to say this to anybody. I know we can't come to rocket launches in person in the near future for a while, but like when you finally get that experience, let the photographers do what the photographers do. If you want to set one, you know, camera up on a tripod, that's cool, but don't bother yourself at the moment of liftoff. Just take it in. Just, it's different. So, then the launch happens. So you've had this crazy day, you know, crazy, crazy, crazy day. And right now the countdown clock isn't working. There's just no personnel supporting anything at NASA. So um, we don't even get a countdown anymore. We just call into the countdown nets or watch for the flames. And the launch happens and the sound, you watch it travel across the water to you. That's powerful. Shit, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's a, yeah. I can't wait for that. Like I felt it and I've seen it, and the night launch has got its own like really cool thing because it lights up the sky like the sun's coming up again. You know, so there's a lot to it. But yeah, I I can't wait to see that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it, it like a sun, an artificial sun rising in the middle of the night reminds me of a total solar eclipse, which I've had the pleasure of seeing as well. And that's another one of those moments. Mm -hmm. but there's there's nothing like a night launch this one was at 3 30 p.m so it was during the day but those are special too and they always get the best photography so it was just amazing to stand there and you know after such a crazy day remember why i'm doing what i'm doing and reconnect with that that thought about what humanity is actually capable of and then you know you beg yourself questions like what do I want to see out of humanity, especially in the middle of this crisis? This is this is what I'm taking the time to think about. Like, we we have a responsibility right now to shape the future with our imaginations, and then strive for that because you have to strive for it or it won't happen. And so I I love these moments where I'm like, wow, we can break gravity. What else can we do? Yeah. And what do we want to do? You know. So. Um, so yeah, you have this profound experience, but then suddenly it's like, all right, everybody clean up and we're gonna pick up the cameras now. Um, we're closing the press site. So, you know, you have to take that in as quickly as you can and then immediately shift focus, get back in the truck. The dog comes back around to smell everything. And then we convoy out to the launch pads and there's a super smoky launch pad where they're once, in the very recent past <laughs> was a rocket and now it's just burned up. And uh, and then you have to quickly, really quickly grab all of your cameras, your tripods. And then this is where I see Ryan. Ryan's a very calm, collected individual, but this is where I can see him kind of shaking. He doesn't say anything, but he's like, 
yeah. you know, because <laughs> when, when you leave the cameras, you know, in that crazy moment where you're like rushing around to make sure you've got everything, you know, properly set, that is a true moment of letting go. You cannot hang on to the constant questioning of, did I, did I turn on the trigger? Uh, was it on the right setting? Oh, did I take the lens cap off? You know, like you, you get these crazy things in your head. You got to let that go. But then you're approaching the launch pad again and they all start to rise back up and you're like, oh my God, did I take the lens cap off? <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and so I see Ryan, he's like, and then he, you know, he takes a moment while he's there to just very silently, quietly look at his camera <laughs> and see, is there something on the camera? Cause yeah. that means it triggered, you know? So Cause I've heard those horror mm. stories of just like I, I had this set up or, you know, I was um, like they wanted to do uh, like not, you know, not a time lapse, but um, uh, the streak shot and then something's happened. Something's gone wrong. And like, oh, man, like I did all this setup for this, you know, flew across the country, set these things up. And this one thing went wrong. And now you got to wait till the next time, which could be months from now, depending on what your your, your schedule is like or what your um, the, the money you make. Can you afford to fly back out to Florida again? So I know that can no. be tough for a lot of people. Yeah. And to be completely honest with you, that's why we're here. So yeah. I told that whole story about how we um, we both met while we were in campers. We so I, I failed to mention that we've spent the last two years roaming the country together from launch pad to launch pad, from California to Florida and back again. And in the mean in the meantime, we were heading out there to catch rocket launches or, you know, um, to Wallops Island, we would go there as well. So in between launches, we would take our space presentation on tour, our cosmic perspective multimedia show. We'd do it at planetariums across the way or you know other places. Burning Man was one of them. Um, so we lived in our trailer or in, in his little truck camper, which is a short bed truck camper. It's gorgeous, it's beautiful um, with our dog, <laughs> which is a medium sized, border collie Australian shepherd mix. So we lived for two years on the road, just going from, you know, launch pad to launch pad. And then in November, when we realized how many launches were going to be taking place here on the space coast, and we realized that humans were going to be launching from here and that all the launch activity was really going to be right here for the foreseeable future. We found a little place and uh, we landed here. We just decided this is home base. And boy, do we feel lucky right now that mm -hmm. we found this place and we are here right now. And that every morning I go out to the beach, which is right there and I look left and I see the New Glen pad progress. Uh, I'm just astounded. So um, we would not be able to afford going back and forth the way that we were at this time. Because since we've lived here, with the exception of the last two months, since we've been here, there have, there have been four launches per month. Yeah. Which is crazy. That's one a week. And it will get to that place again. Um, anyway, so that's a really good point. And even for us, there are always failures. You know, that's why we set up so many cameras because we want to make sure that we get something. And sometimes it all works. <laughs> it's just like the most glorious thing. And sometimes none of it works. It's crazy. There's always, there's just always something. And, you know, sometimes it's not even your fault. It's like a crazy rainstorm comes in and everybody's lenses are totally fogged up. So you, nobody comes out away with really anything. So it happened to more than a few star parties over the years too. Just like, Oh, yeah. we're a big event. And then it rains out the whole week. So yeah, I know that can be really tough. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know if you saw our, um, <laughs> When Tim Dodd live streamed the SpaceX Crew Dragon uh, in-flight abort test, mm -hmm. which was like the rarest moment in rocket launch chronicling history <laughs> where we knew that a rocket was going to explode. And that's the whole reason that Tim did the deal with OPT telescopes and we set up the telescope to track that rocket so we could capture the explosion. We it was amazing. Like we nobody had had any sleep. We spent forever setting this new system up. We had cameras all over the place. It was amazing. And then suddenly the rocket, like literally right before the explosion, 
the rocket enters a thick <laughs> cloud layer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Tim screaming, no. And we're just, I'm dying laughing. I'm like, I can't believe it. What can you do? Like, yeah, it's just when, when Mother Nature decides to get in the way, there's not a whole lot you can do. That's one of the reasons that it's so popular that you see. Oh, you know, it's like every other night, it's a completely clear sky. But when it's a rare astro uh, astronomical event or a rocket launch, the the sky is full of clouds. <laughs> you know, you're just good luck. It's just it's what's going to happen. But yeah, no, I saw that. That was heartbreaking. Like we all felt it. Like oh, <laughs> oh my gosh, it was it was so crazy. But yeah, these these things happen. And then of course, um, there are like a rare few people that are on the other side of that cloud somehow, on the other side of Cape Canaveral that did capture it. So at least. You know, we know what that beautiful thing looked like. But um, yeah, so once once it's all over and you collect your cameras, it does not end there. It's like, it almost feels like a new start to a new day, even though there's not like sleep involved. <laughs> but, you know, now we're talking, it's like 6 p.m. We've been up since 5 a.m., 6 p.m., I mean, we just race. Like, even even if we could talk to our rocket crew friends, all of us are just like, "All right, see you later." And, you know, you yeah, get yeah. in the car, and you're <laughs> like, "I need to, I need to get back to a computer that can process all of this." Of course, John, like, he has a really cool mobile setup. I'm talking about launch photographer John Cross, who's a good good friend, but um, he's got a little iPad Lightroom situation. So in his car, he immediately gets his stuff processed and online, but with slow-mo and the VR stuff and, um, you know, the time-lapse, this all requires so much processing and rendering time. And then of course we don't stop at the, you know, rendering it out and throwing it online. We're trying to get better at that just to like tease things out. So people, you know, see what's coming and they get excited, but we always try to attach it to a story and and really like create something really beautiful that causes pause so that people can kind of get that same feeling that the launch gives us without being at the launch, you know? So we use music, emotional music, and, you know, maybe some audio snippets to guide the feeling. And so, you know, we, uh, we come home and look through all the cameras. I also set up these binaural mics so I capture all of the rocket launch sounds in binaural audio, which means that if you've got headphones on, it kind of like, it feels as if you're actually there. It's a really beautiful feeling. And I, I look through that and if I've done a, an interview that day, that's where I'll be, you know, reviewing the interview footage and I'll be trying to put it into our podcast format. And uh, meanwhile, Ryan's in the other room pouring over the video footage and eventually we come together and, and we've got something, but there's little sleep that happens. And like, we forget to eat. These are these are the kind of the unhealthy moments where we're like, oh, I feel crazy. Should we, yes, we should eat something. One of us should definitely <laughs> put something on the stove. Um, but yeah, and that kind of continues for days because this video stuff is, like I say, sometimes it takes uh, an overnight period of time to process footage. So um, it'll be days afterwards that we continue to tease stuff out and then come out with something bigger, um, you know, maybe even a week for a podcast episode. But yeah, we're, we're kind of still living in the time of Wednesday, like this. Yeah. And, and now that SpaceX is, I actually forgot about the whole thing where, you know, <laughs> fairings and boosters get returned to the port here. So that's why Ryan's not here. He's at the port waiting to get footage of that so that he can add that to the video. So that it's a full story. Um, so yeah, it's it's exhilarating to say the least. I mean, it, it really is. And so um, this is actually, uh, so normally we do about a half an hour and this is, uh, you're running up on Oh, I'm hour. so yeah, there's, sorry. There's so, well, I mean, but that's kind of the thing though, is that this is just such an intensive thing. And there's so few people that are talking about it. And that's what you all do best. It's one of the reasons why you're one of the perfect people to talk to um, about what this experience is. And so we barely touched on stuff. There, there's plenty of stuff that it comes to, like, you know, what you're doing with the website, what, you know, with the, with the writings that you do with everything from like the Kickstarter. There's still so much more that we could talk about. But so that way everybody can kind of know, like, where can people find all this stuff that you're doing? Because we really did. We just barely scratched the surface of what you two are up to. So can you give us a little background, like, you know, just the website, some things that people are going to find on the website, and then all your stuff on social media? Yeah, thank you. And I'm so sorry. I do get long-winded. I hope I haven't uh, 
ruined your next wire friend i'm lucky that way the idea of doing a half hour show with somebody that's uh, that blabbers like i do mm -mm. so you (laughs) understand it's fine (laughs) i couldn't possibly do it um cosmicperspective.com is the best place to go um there's there's even more that isn't there that needs to be but for now that's where you can find the latest so we not only you know we share the news of what's going on today. We share our perspectives of what's going on today. Our videos can be found there. Um, our augmented reality posters and postcard collectibles can be found there. We also have a list of upcoming space events. So I've been trying to keep my head around all of the new Zoom meetings and space events happening. So, I'm, you know, the website is, is turning away from just being a place for us to share our stuff. And it's also becoming a resource portal for the the space family as a whole. We're really passionate about that. So, just to touch on a couple of the other things that we do, we're writing a, we're writing a book. It's actually an augmented reality book, so it'll be interactive. Um, it's it's really um, it's about this time in human history. It's also about the broader cosmic perspective. You know why that's so important to us. Um, the film follows suit. And uh, I'm also working on some really cool things with really big artists and orchestras. So I'm my passion is really about bridging the music with the story, you know, so I'm getting back to that initial um, calling and uh, or mission. And so I'm, I'm working on a big, big space show um, that's kind of working with rock bands and I'm working with orchestras on that. So yeah, a lot of cool stuff on the horizon. Wait, I mean, yeah, they, there's, there's fewer things that, you know, a retired DJ that, you know, like went through all this stuff and like you, a lot, so much of your story is, um, is something that I relate to. And it was awesome to even really be, begin to talk about all the amazing stuff that you all are up to uh, so much more to talk about in the future. Uh, so really excited for everything you're doing. Thank you so much for coming on today. Um, just uh, one, I can't wait to see what the video looks like once it's done. Hopefully he captured some really cool stuff today. And uh, it was really, truly an honor. Thank you so much for coming in on and uh, just sharing the amazing story of what it's like to be, you know, a rocket chaser in uh, these, you know, this, this new era of what's happening. Yeah. Thank you, Ron, for everything that you do for having me. And thanks to everybody who was here. And sorry, I didn't get more to your comments, but I really appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so everybody, that's going to conclude this episode of the live edition of Space Foundation Space for You podcast. Uh, keep your eyes and ears open for more Space for You episodes by checking out our social media outlets on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And of course, on our website at spacefoundation.org. And do not forget, we actually have a, uh, a really special announcement right now. Later today, we're going to be talking with Dwayne Digger Carey, who was part of the last Hubble um, maintenance mission. So we're going to really have some cool stuff and talk about Hubble a little bit today on the 30th anniversary. And uh, so we always love whenever you guys check out our stuff. Discoverspace.org has so many incredible resources right now. So that way we can bring uh, space right to your home. So please go check that out whenever you can. And on all these outlets and more, it is our goal to inspire, educate, connect, and advocate for the space community. Because at the Space Foundation, we will always have space for you. Thank you so much for joining today and we will see you all on the next show on month uh, a little bit later today time coming soon <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you